Sometimes you really just have to give it to game developers who hide something incredibly clever in their games in the most incredibly clever way. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 Easter eggs that are absolutely genius. Starting off with Red Dead Redemption 2 and the Venus de Milo Easter egg. Starting off with a simple one that makes you feel like a genius for even noticing. In RDR 2, you probably notice these statues around the city of San Dennis. They're usually found in parks and the yards of these like mansions in the outside of the city, like just on the outskirts. There's a lot of them uh, and they're not too hard to miss. Like a lot of objects in the game, when you shoot a statue, it breaks. In this case, you can specifically shoot both its arms off. That doesn't look great, but there's a reason I'm doing this. It's an Easter egg. Uh, I, I swear, I swear to God, that doesn't sound convincing. Just stick with me for a minute. Like look at the way the arms break. It makes the same statue look strikingly similar to Venus de Milo, one of the most famous surviving statues from Greek antiquity. It's not one to one the same, but it's so similar, it might be a reference, which is a pretty deep cut rock star. Most games have 30 year old references tops. This game is like, hey, let's let's go for 2000 years two literal millennia, 2000 year old callbacks here. Uh, the statue is one of those classical cultural touchstones that we get referenced all the time in pop culture. But la last place I expected to see a Venus de Milo would be uh, Red Red Redemption 2. At number 9 is the Dead Space Remake's Secret Sea Shanty, which is nearly impossible to say. This is like take 5. It's a real she sells seashells by the seashore type situation. Although I don't know why I was able to do that so easily and not saying the words Secret Sea Shanty. Uh, but whatever. There's an Easter egg I see mentioned a lot on lists like this. Uh, the Dead Space chapter names thing, where the game hides a secret message in the first letter of every chapter name in the game. If you've never seen it, look it up, uh, but that's not what I'm talking about here. And instead of focusing on this really clever little secret added to the game with the remake, once you get access to the full area of the bridge, you can find this break room on floor 3, which has a picture of the marker in this strange circle in the middle of the room. It's easy to just wander in there, look at the floor, shrug, and walk out, but there's a little puzzle to solve here, and it makes you feel like a genius for solving it. It's not impossibly hard or anything, but it's one of those things where it seems like it can't possibly work. What you're supposed to do is look down at the circle, uh, you know, see the symbols. They're either foots or fists, and they make up a code. Starting from the top, you have to melee for the fists and stomp for the feet in a sequence like a weird cheat code. If done correctly, you get an audio log that contains a spooky sea shanty about the Ishimura. It's totally unnecessary, but the people who manage to solve this one on their own are just gonna feel really clever. And number eight is Batman Arkham City, the Calendar Man secret. This one's kind of a classic, but it's so good, I've gotta bring it up again anyway. In, in Batman Arkham City, you can find the Calendar Man locked up in a cell underneath the courthouse. He has different messages depending on when you talk to him, and for a while, people thought they'd found everything he has to say. I believe you crave independence. Enjoy the loneliness. Come back and tell me. It took about three years, or at least three years, but eventually somebody figured out something new. If you talk to him, on the day of the developer Rocksteady's founding, he has one final cryptic message. The reason this took so long for people to figure out is that it can't just be the anniversary of Rocksteady, it has to be this specific date, so the only way to see this message is to roll back the system clock to 2004. If you do that, the calendar man says, I was there at your beginning, and I will be there at your end. Which is a pretty sinister statement. And it's hard to believe there would be any follow up there, but Rock said he'd never leave an Easter egg hanging. Uh, when you 100% Arkham City's sequel, Arkham Knight, Batman initiates the Nightfall Protocol. This triggers the game's true ending, where a crowd watches as Bruce Wayne, whose secret identity has been exposed, returns to Wayne Manor right before it suddenly explodes in a dramatic fashion. A pretty definitive end, right? I mean, Batman's obviously not dead, but that's the end of the trilogy. Sure enough, if you look closely at the crowd, you can see the distinctive bald head of the calendar man in the crowd. It's a blink and you'll miss it thing, but he's there. It's that absurd level of detail that makes the Arkham series one of the best trilogies 
trilogies of all time, e even something as ultimately pointless as the calendar, man. Saying something cryptic gets followed up on. At number 7 is Call of Duty Black Ops 2's Activision Atari Easter Egg. Nuketown's a map that's seen many iterations, but the one we're focusing on today is Nuketown 2025, the one from Black Ops 2 specifically. Most versions of this map have some Easter Egg connected to shooting off the heads of the mannequins that are everywhere, but you normally just get some music as a reward. Unlocking this one's pretty straightforward, you just run around and knock off the dummy head in 2 minutes. By yourself, it's pretty tight, but with a friend it's super easy. So, the actual process of unlocking this easter egg is obviously not the genius part. It's the reward. If you did everything right, you can interact with the TV at the entrance sign and you'll be able to play from a selection of Activision Atari games. You even get a pixel art hand holding an Atari controller. It's really, really good. I enjoy the hell out of it. Part of what makes it so interesting though is how it taps into video game history. Uh, like, did you know that Activision was actually the first third party developer ever? They were originally formed by programmers from Atari who knew how to program games for the system, so they just started printing their own. Atari sued and they settled out of court by agreeing to pay a license fee to Atari for their games, which basically invented the entire model for third party developers going forward. These games are not that much fun to play today, but it's still a pretty elaborate and impressive secret that also manages to pay homage to Activision's long history in the video game business. And number six is Borderlands, the pre-sequel, a little 2001 The Space Odyssey thing. If you're looking for highbrow references to cinematic classics, the Borderlands series probably isn't the first place you'd go. Dumb memes, absolutely, but an extended 2001 Space Odyssey riff is unexpected, to say the least. Found in this far off corner in Stan's liver, you can find this monolith in the middle of a crater. Uh, in most games, that's where the reference would end. That's more than enough to just go, oh, it's 2001 The Space Odyssey. But here, you can actually run right into it, and that's that's where the genius stuff actually starts. First are the transitions themselves, which are right out of the movie. It, it transports you to the white room. Uh, there's no bed, but the portraits are there. You go through the monolith again, you get a shot referencing the Star Child at the end of the movie before dumping you off at a recreation of the Moon Dig site, again straight out of 2001. I don't know if you have to be a genius to get this one. 2001 is an obvious cultural touchstone, uh, but I bet the devs thought they were pretty smart for including it. I, I mean, they definitely went above and beyond what you expect for an Easter egg like this one too. And number five is Dying Light 2's Hoverboard. Okay, Back to the Future references aren't exactly genius, but in this case, it's really satisfying. Dying Light 2 has some great Easter eggs, but this one is a lot of people's all-time favorite for very good reason. It's tricky to unlock, but the reward is worth it, even if the final result is a little more limited than what you might expect. This Easter egg starts at the Church of St. Thomas the Apostle, and you start it by hooking up some power to a panel inside the steeple. Once it's done, you interact with the radio, which is actually another Easter egg because the two guys on the radio are Fatim and Tolga from the first game, and once they're done yammering, a hoverboard appears nearby. Grab it, and a red trail will appear that leads to a few more hoverboards. Eventually, you'll find enough and you'll finally get the opportunity to ride one uh, in a special obstacle course. Yeah, it'd be better if you could just use it wherever you wanted, but it's still pretty fun. It's actually even a little punishing, uh, maybe even to an absurd extent, depending on your perspective on what you should be able to do. But being able to use a hoverboard is still extremely satisfying, and there's nothing stopping you from leaving the course and going for a joyride at least until the timer runs out. And number four is Hi-Fi Rush, uh, the Xenogears Easter Egg. Hi-Fi Rush is a game that comes at you hard and fast with references, Easter eggs, and secrets, and some of these things are pretty obscure. Some of the best ones are actually hidden in plain sight, like this extended Xenogears Easter Egg from Track 10. Just to set this up, Xenogears is a 1998 PlayStation 1 RPG known for two things. It's got an Evangelion-inspired story, and it has a second disc, which is infamously incomplete. At a certain point in the game, the story just grinds to a dead stop, and instead of things progressing like, you know, a finished game would, you're instead bombarded with weird cuts scenes and characters and everything appears in a void and explain what's supposed to be happening. 
they didn't have the time or resources to actually show you any of this stuff, so instead the game just kind of tells you all the cool stuff they were going to put there, and sometimes it'll cut back to actual gameplay for the parts they managed to finish. Again, very, very Evangelion inspired. For whatever reason, Hi-Fi Rush, a game from 2023, includes an extended riff on this whole thing. On track 10, uh, because the game did really run out of time, possibly, or maybe as a joke, they show a section of the story playing out exactly the same way it did in Xenogears. Black Void and a swinging thing in the background and all. Uh, it's not just a reference to a now obscure old PS1 game, it's a reference to a really specific part of it. For anyone who played the game, it is a hilarious callback, and the fact that it comes so long after the game actually, you know, released, is probably gonna make it that much funnier for those people, but uh, for everybody else, it's probably just confusing. It's hardly the only genius easter egg, though. I mean, this is a game with an extended reference to the 80s music staple 808 drum machine, uh, also a full Twin Peaks reference reference some amazing, amazing stuff in this game for people who are looking for some deep pulls. And number three is Hitman 2's elaborate Tomb Raider secret. I spent a lot of time talking about the great Easter eggs in the Hitman trilogy, but here's another one. In the final mission of Hitman 2, there's a guy named Nathaniel Blake, a treasure hunter, which, I mean, uncharted. But that's the tip of the iceberg. You're Blake Nathaniel, right? But if you don't mind me asking... People have been searching for the Cloud Serpent for centuries. Wherever did you find it? If you manage to take his clothes, yes, that's <laughs> that's where this is going immediately. Then you actually have to find a butler up in the tower and have him follow you all the way down to the castle's freezer where you can lock him inside. Sort of like another treasure hunter's butler, right? If you will just follow me. Certainly, sir. In Tomb Raider 2, locking up Lara's creepy butler in the freezer is a time-honored tradition. The butler in Hitman 2 even comments on it. When you get him in there, he says this is exactly what happened to his cousin Winston, directly referencing the character from Tomb Raider. Exactly what happened to cousin Winston. It doesn't end there either. Uh, with the butler locked up, you unlock a new means of escaping the map, a classic Tomb Raider swan dive into the water. And number two in Tunic, the second language, uh, just reading about this blew my mind. This is a game I thought I'd been pretty thorough about, but just now I found out there's a whole other level of understanding I just didn't have. Tunic is a game all about secrets, obviously. One of those secrets is the language of the world, known as runes. They're pretty obvious. It's just that it takes a long time and a lot of work to fully decipher it. For most people, that's about as deep as it gets, because you don't need to learn anymore to complete the game and also finish the big golden path secret. There's not a lot of reason to keep learning it. But there is an even greater secret in the game that as of this moment is not fully understood. That's because there's actually a second language in the game known as Tunic. Tunes. It may seem like all the characters speak a gibberish in Tunic, but that's not actually true. They speak in a series of notes that can actually be transcribed and translated. For example, when the bells chime, the sounds they make can actually be translated as saying ding and dong. Seriously, it's not just the characters talking or some sound effects, the language is hidden in the music. Why would they go through all this trouble? Maybe it's just to look like a bunch of geniuses, because it worked, if that was the, the goal. They look very smart for having done this. And finally, at number one, Metal Gear Solid 5's Portopia Mystery. E Easter eggs that have something to do with sound just come off is really smart to me for whatever reason. The way sound is able to broadcast data is something that almost sounds like magic, but it's just how information can be stored on cassette tapes. One of the most mysterious and obscure Easter eggs in Metal Gear Solid 5 has to do with cassettes, two of them in particular. One is a tape called Classified Intel Data, which has a series of loud screeching noises on it. and the other is a tape called Operation Intrude N313. It's shown at the very end of the game, has a similar sound, it plays at the end. The meta implication of the second tape is 
brilliant as it is. That's not just a tape deck at the end, it's an MSX2, the console that the first Metal Gear game came out on. The first mission in that game, Operation Intrude N313, so the tape literally contains the first Metal Gear game. People somehow managed to translate the sound data and turn it into the code for the first tape, which was revealed to be the data for a game called Portopia Serial Murder Case, a game that Kojima has said was a major inspiration for him getting into game design. It's an extremely deep cut that certain conspiracy-minded Metal Gear enthusiasts have taken to mean there's some kind of final secret hidden in the game somewhere, but at this point, I think it's safe to say that these hidden tapes are just some obscure Easter eggs, and maybe it might be good to leave it at that. For me, anyway. Maybe somebody else will find something and blow the whole thing wide open. That'd be super cool, but I I'm out here. <laughs> it's enough for me. Uh, hopefully it's enough for you as well, because that's the end of the video. If you liked it, leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. Click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. The best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.